Welcome to a special episode of VoxDev Talks, recorded at the 2023 Conference on Structural Transformation, Growth and Economic Development. My name is Tim Phillips. Well, I'm at the London School of Economics to visit the conference. It was organized by the Structural Transformation and Economic Growth Program, that's known as STEG. This is a five-year program of academic research. It's funded by the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And the conference was held in collaboration with the Centre for Economic Policy Research and the International Growth Centre, who, of course, are two of the partners in VoxDev. Nina Pouchnik of Dartmouth sat the conference. Uh, she's giving a keynote based on her research. It examines the long-term impact of a bilateral trade agreement in one low-income country. And it offers some surprising insights into how this agreement created jobs as part of a structural transformation. So I caught up with her afterwards. So Nina, welcome. Thank you. It's not news, Nina, that trade policy, and tariff reductions in particular, can attract foreign direct investment. But what's the standard pattern for this? And why is it important when we're talking about economic development? It turns out that the old idea was that if, when you had high barriers to trade, like mm. so high tariffs, that would attract foreign direct investment because by producing in the country where you wanted to sell goods, for example, let's say you're a German manufacturer and wanting to sell in the United States. If tariffs on German cars are high in the United States, you basically can overcome those tariffs by producing directly in the United States. So that was like the previous wisdom. But as global value chains became more complicated, mm -hmm. if, for example, countries started using certain countries for export platforms, then having low barriers to trade vis-a-vis -vis large export markets can actually encourage foreign direct investment into that particular country. Previous research, it has identified impacts on the host country. It focuses on particular types of impacts, hasn't it? What is your focus here? Yeah, so we have a really neat slice of global supply chains because they are super complicated. Yeah. And so basically, rather than trying to study all of it, we say, look, we have low income country that has comparative advantage in producing goods that require a lot of less educated labor mm -hmm. and that had pretty large barriers to exporting to potentially the most important export destination, United States. And all of a sudden, United States lowers these barriers to trade. Well, let's see what happens. We're talking about job creation specifically here. Why don't we know more about job creation in this context? It seems a very big impact, a very important one. Absolutely. And in fact, when you talk to the policymakers, they oftentimes are very concerned in low-income countries, mm -hmm. like how do you generate more jobs, especially in the more kind of formal manufacturing sectors yeah. uh, as opposed to kind of informal self-employed jobs. However, for economics, we tended to focus a lot on like how does for and direct investment, transfer technology, provides spillovers to other countries. And while policymakers also focus on that, economists really just focus a lot on that because we tend to care on productivity because productivity is like key to economic development all over the long run. Mm -hmm. But what makes life interesting, right, is like how do countries transition from low income to middle lower income status and an important component of that is people getting jobs or more formal jobs. Yeah, if you're a policymaker, if you're a politician, it's very difficult for you to go back to people and say productivity has increased by this much. But if you say we have created this many thousand jobs, well, that's important. Yeah, I mean, it? I think both play a role, yes. but one is more longer term and one is much more short term focused. Yes. So specifically to the research you've done here, you investigated a bilateral agreement in 2001. It was between the US and Vietnam. What was this agreement? What changed? Vietnam and the United States had virtually no trade up to 1996, in mm. part because after the Vietnam War, the United States imposed sanctions on Vietnam. However, you know, President Clinton started towing the relationships with Vietnam and created normalized trading relationships. And this culminated in 2001 bilateral trade agreement that basically where the main policy change was literally United States moving Vietnam from one tariff schedule, which was the tariff was basically imposed on you know non-market economies. Mm -hmm. uh, these were basically smooth heavily, you know, depression tariffs, two uh, most favored nation tariffs, which are the tariffs negotiated between the United States and its trading partners between World Trade Organization. 
from the researcher's perspective, it's a really interesting trade agreement because you don't need to worry about politicians and industry groups trying to influence tariff changes because they are basically predetermined. You're literally moving a country from one predetermined tariff schedule to another. So, mm. you know, it's a gold mine from the perspective of a researcher to study that. But, you know, the key thing for Vietnam, it was that this really reduced by, on average, like 30 percentage points, that's a large change, Wow. tariffs or so taxes that Vietnamese export faced in United States, which is really, really important export destination. And so this obviously increases the opportunity for existing firms within Vietnam that want to export to the United States. Yes, but you have also been looking for the effect on new entrants into the Vietnamese economy. Why might it be important for the economy if there are new entrants? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in some of my research, we looked at this trade agreement, and what we found is that in industries where tariffs that Vietnamese exports faced in the United States increased more, workers were more likely to switch from kind of informal jobs to formal jobs. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what a lot of policymakers are hoping for their countries to achieve. So we found that. But then what we also found is that this was not necessarily happening because informal firms were formalizing. It was really literally like, you know, either workers switching from informal self-employed job or like working for somebody else's informal business to an establishment in the formal sector. And what we were curious about is like, well, where are these formal jobs coming from? Mm -hmm. It could be that they are just coming from existing formal firms. But when we looked at the data, we realized that there was enormous amount of entry of new firms, both private domestic Vietnamese firms, as well as foreign firms into the sectors that benefited the most from these improved exporting opportunities. And the reason why entry matters is that, first of all, it can generate a lot more jobs. It can also potentially bring in new technology, like foreign firms might be bringing in more technology, or they might be overcoming the constraints that existing firms have in terms of expansion. And it turns out that especially foreign entrants in Vietnam enter bigger than private domestic firms, and they are also able to expand. It's a fascinating perspective on what a structural transformation actually means on the ground. Mm -hmm. Now, when you investigated this, you looked at the differing impact on jobs and you separated clearly these foreign invested enterprises, but then you also separated the private domestic firms and the state-owned enterprises, of which there were a lot in Vietnam, I think, at the time. Why you separate the response for domestic firms and those state-owned enterprises? Mm -hmm. Yeah, paying attention to the distinction between private domestic firms and state-owned enterprises is really crucial in a country like Vietnam, where mm -hmm. right before the trade agreement, almost 50% of formal jobs in manufacturing were in state-owned enterprises. <laughs> and as we know from other research, state-owned enterprises tend to have preferential access to financing, you know, maybe like land deals and so on, which actually then might make it much more difficult for private domestic firms to, even if they are very talented, right by great managers, to expand because they might not have the same access to finance, land, and human talent. And that's why we were actually very curious, you know, how do state-owned enterprises react versus private domestic firms? And then this is where also examining how foreign private firms are responding to the trade agreement differentially also matters because foreign firms tend to be more productive, have access to better technology, can rely on their own parent multinationals for financing. So even though they will be facing competition from state-owned enterprises, they also well positioned to compete with them. Yeah. This is now a story that's two decades old. So you've got lots of data. First of all, let's look at the initial impact. What was the immediate impact of this trade agreement for the domestic firms and the state-owned enterprises? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we find is that, let me actually stack a little bit back. What we find is like, as soon as the trade agreement is signed, you see this large increase in exports from Vietnam to United States. And in mm -hmm. fact, it's almost like, how could it happen so quickly? Uh, <laughs> But then you're curious, like, well, what does that mean for production and employment in Vietnam? And what we observe is that both private domestic firms are entering in response to this export opportunities. Like, so new firms are being established, both private domestic and foreign. But what we are finding then is that the private domestic firms are just not growing in terms of employment. 
Right. But what about the foreign firms? With foreign firms, to begin with, they enter larger. So they already at the entry create more of these formal jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then what's actually staggering over the period of these 20 years, if you actually follow, let's say, firms that entered in 2001, if you look at them, how large, like foreign firms, how large are they by almost 20 years later, you find they are four times larger. Whoa. So not only do they enter larger, they also grow more afterwards. And what we find is these reductions in trade policy are important contributor to explaining, you know, why these firms enter the affected sector as well as like why the subsequent employment growth. Tell me more about the character of these foreign firms. I would have thought initially that they would be, say, American firms that could now outsource very effectively because they're not paying the tariffs on the way back in. Is that the character of it? That was my hunch initially when we started this research project. Mm. It turns out it was completely wrong. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) And that's why research is great, like you learn. (laughs) (laughs) No, so it turns out that most of the foreign direct investment prior to the agreement came from East Asia. It came from Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan. Uh And what turns out is that in response to this trade agreement, it is the foreign affiliates of multinationals from Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan that really take the most advantage of this trade agreement. They are the ones that are establishing these affiliates in Vietnam. United States multinationals accounted only for less than 2% of the foreign firms. Yeah. That is remarkable, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So has this change continued to evolve Vietnam's economy? Absolutely. Like this trade agreement was implemented at the end of 2001, and then we can basically follow it for the next 20 years, like implication. And what we see is that it really accounts for a pretty large share of expansion of employment in the formal sector through these multinationals. What's interesting is that things grow for about like eight to 10 years and then kind of stabilize. But nonetheless, those jobs are then not going away because oftentimes people worry that with foreign affiliates of multinationals, yes, they are well positioned to potentially take advantage of this sort of trade policy change, but they also foot loose. But if there's another opportunity, they can go somewhere else. It's tactical. Yeah. Yes. And what we actually, at least for now, we mm-hmm. are not finding those effects yet. It might happen in the future, but it's not happening right now. So, you know, from that perspective, we have documented that, you know, this trade agreement, which was very unique, that enabled like a low-income country that is well-positioned to expand its kind of less educated, intensive industries to exports to the United States and other markets, those effects tend to be actually quite persistent for 20 years. And you only have to visit Vietnam now to see how dramatic the change Mm -hmm. in its economy has been. If you want to know more about STEG, its funding, its research agenda, and its future events, well then visit STEG, that's spelt S-T-E-G, dot C-E-P-R dot org. This is a story about Vietnam, which was one country at one particular time, with one particular mm-hmm. set of problems that it had to solve. Can this story tell us about how trade policy in general can influence structural transformation? That's a very good question. It's very hard to answer question. But what I would say is like, what I think it's really important is to think about why was this agreement such a, in a sense, like success in terms of job creation in Vietnam. And I think like Vietnam was like very well positioned from benefit for the following reasons. And these are kind of like Think, things to think about, like when we were thinking about other countries, whether or not like trade policy can influence structural transformation. For once, Vietnam, because of its historical past, tended to have more educated population than other countries at that level of development. So in that sense, they were well positioned to benefit from trade policy change opportunities and multinationals coming in. And also they were more attractive in terms of location. They also had a young population, which it's easier to move if you're younger. And so again, that, that was like something that worked to Vietnam advantage. So from perspective of other countries, like kind of looking at like what do demographics of the countries and education of the country look like when we are evaluating implications of trade policy for their structural transformation. The other thing that benefited Vietnam is that it was really well geographically positioned because it's very close to already established global supply chains within East Asia. And part of the reason why 
multinationals from Taiwan and Korea and Japan were not previously investing in Vietnam prior to this trade agreement is because oftentimes they want to export to lots of countries, including Vietnam. But to set up an affiliate, you know, the fixed costs are pretty large. If it's expensive to export to the United States, you might not be willing to invest in Vietnam. That said, once those costs are reduced, multinationals have incentives to come there. And given that they already have well-established linkages in that region, it might be easier for these multinationals from East Asian countries to respond to this trade agreement than, for example, U.S. multinationals that are not as well established in that area. That in part explains why it was actually multinationals from East Asia responding more to the export opportunities. But again, it also, Vietnam was very well positioned geographically to take advantage of these pre-existing global supply chain linkages. So kind of looking more broadly, when we are evaluating what are the implications of trade policy for structural change in other countries, again, like it's useful to think about like, well, how close is this country to existing global supply chain linkages? Because that might actually aid the structural transformation process. Nevertheless, this agreement, that era could be called peak globalization, really, couldn't it? And the mood music now, politically, certainly in high income countries, is very, very different. The phrase that you are much more likely to hear now is the retreat from globalization. Considering the dividend in its development that Vietnam has achieved from this agreement and the number of jobs it has created. Does this mean the retreat from globalization is bad news for the structural transformation of other low-income countries? You know, I think the the situation currently is definitely different. And I think the way it is different in part is that even if trade bears have not been risen vis-a-vis some lower income countries, there's this threat that they might be risen, right? And just having the uncertainty about trade policy, mm. we have a lot of evidence that suggests that's actually precluding companies to potentially invest in a particular country. So that's definitely something that lower income countries need to be thinking about it. On the other hand, you know, on top of that, one thing that lower income countries can be doing, though, is thinking about like, well, can we rely on trade among each other or between lower and middle income countries to generate the benefits that Vietnam experienced over the past 20 years? So I think thinking more about like, how can one rely not just on high income markets, given in today's world of where we can ensure that like globalization will continue to happen that can provide new pathway for these structural transformation changes. Oh, it's a fascinating story. And uh, as you say, it's got one that still has a lot of relevance for what's happening today and in the near future. Nina, thanks for talking about it. Thank you for having me. The paper is called FDI Inflows and Domestic Firms Adjustments to New Export Opportunities. The authors are Nina Pouchnik, Brian McCaig, and Won Fung Wong. This has been a Vox Dev Talk. The best way to make sure you don't miss an episode is to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, our past podcasts are all at voxdev.org where we also have articles about the papers we feature.